So we are continuing in our sermon series here for Advent, um, kneeling to flourish in love for the world. And so as part of that, we have been inviting people who are from different parts of the world and who speak different languages than English that we often speak here to come forward and share with us by praying the Lord's Prayer in those languages, by reading our scripture in those languages. So this morning, we get the treat of hearing two languages. We're going to uh, have the Lord's Prayer in Portuguese and our scripture reading in Spanish. So I'm going to invite Tori and Bia forward at this time. And uh, let's see, make sure this is turned on. So first, Bia, first, can you guys tell us just a little bit about yourselves? Not, not much, whatever. Just tell us a little bit. Um, I'm a freshman at Pella Christian, and I learned Spanish through the Spanish Immersion Program at school. And your name is? Oh, Tori Van Zee. Nice. <laughs> I'm Bia Andrade, and I'm from Brazil. I'm a junior at Pella Christian, too. Okay, thank you. So would you uh, join us as we pray and as we're reminded that we are part of a a big church around the world and lots of people. And just as we are gathered here today to praise and prepare our hearts for Advent and for the arrival of Jesus, so too are people all around the world worshiping Jesus in so many different languages. So with that, let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples with Bia, and she's going to lead us in Portuguese. Pai nosso que estás no céu, santificado seja o teu nome. Venha a nós o teu reino, seja feita a tua vontade, assim na terra como nos céus. Dá-nos hoje o pão de cada dia. Perdoa nossas dívidas, assim como nós perdoamos os nossos devedores. E não nos deixe cair em tentação, mas livra-nos do mal. Porque teu é o reino, o poder e a glória para sempre. Amém. Amen. So let's join that prayer with our own in English. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So now as Tori's going to read our passage in, uh, in Spanish, I invite you, if you brought your Bibles, find it. If you are doing your Bible on your phone, find it. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. So it's right there at the beginning of the New Testament. And um, I'm a big, I, if you're able, I'm a big, let's stand as we read God's word together. So if you are able, would you please stand as Tori leads us in reading our word today. El nacimiento de Jesús el Cristo fue así. Su madre María estaba comprometida para casarse con José, pero antes de unirse a él resultó que estaba encinta por obra del Espíritu Santo. Como José, su esposo, era un hombre justo y no quería exponerla a vergüenza pública, resolvió divorciarse de ella en secreto. Pero cuando él estaba considerando hacerlo, se le apareció en sueños un ángel del Señor y le dijo, José, hijo de David, no temas recibir a María por esposa, porque ella ha concebido por obra del Espíritu Santo. Dará a luz un hijo y le pondrás por nombre Jesús, porque él salvará a su pueblo de sus pecados. Todo esto sucedió para que se cumpliera lo que el Señor había dicho. Por medio del profeta, la Virgen concebirá y dará a luz un hijo y lo llamarán Emmanuel, que significa Dios con nosotros. Cuando José se despertó, hizo lo que el ángel del Señor le había mandado y recibió a María por esposa, pero no tuvo relaciones conyugales con ella hasta que dio a luz un hijo, a quien le puso por nombre Jesús. People of God, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And as you're being seated, can we give a hand for Tori and Bia for leading us this morning? That's awesome. And I'm grateful for Tori. That's way better than I could do. I've spent many years since I tried to use my Spanish that much. So thank you both for leading us. So, as we look at this passage today, we're going to go through it in a classic reform style, in three points, everybody. <laughs> But the three points are this, be messy, be saved, and be 
available. And uh, that last one, be available, it's kind of got, if you want to put parentheses behind it, it's two parts, listen and response. So we got be messy, be saved, and be available. So listen and response. So this story, now if you were tracking along, if you were able to track along, maybe not, but I'm going to read different parts of it now uh, in English just in case you weren't able to. But it starts like this. It goes, it's straightforward to the point. We've had a whole 17 verses of Jesus' genealogy, a bunch of names, but now it's like this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. So the story is very straightforward and to the point at this point. We got Mary. She's pregnant, even though Joseph and her have never had sex. That's the big deal right off the get-go. They were, though, due to be hitched, right? And in this context, in this Jewish context, it's likely that Mary was probably a younger teenager and Joseph could have been considerably older. But Joseph, you know, it's one of those moments where Mary's pregnant and then Joseph realizes he is not the father. You know, if you're tracking with me, modern television. If you're not, that's okay. Probably better that you don't know that reference. But he is not the father. And before I start to chastise Joseph for his response, and oftentimes I think we kind of like to pile on Joseph, this Joseph guy, he finds us out and he's like, I'm going to ditch Mary. Let's just put ourselves in that context just for a moment. Your soon-to-be wife, not wife yet, but you're engaged, is pregnant, and you know it's not yours. <laughs> That's a big deal now, but it was a huge deal back then. And to Joseph's credit, he says, you know what, I'm going to take care of this issue quietly. Now, he could have taken Mary in a legal process before a bunch of teachers or judges and had the whole thing out publicly and in court, but instead he says, I just want to handle it privately and I want to get on with my life. But the thing that I notice about Joseph in the first part of the story, because Joseph's going to get a whole lot better, is that a lot of us, I think, can approach people and situations the way Joseph uh, approached this situation which is that when situations and when people get messy, we want out and we want to get some distance from that. That when messes start to happen in our lives, when, when things get a little bit out of order, we don't want to be in the midst of that. And I think that Joseph, you know, he has good intentions, right? He has good intentions that he says, I don't want to make a big deal of this but I don't want to deal with this. You know, I, I don't want to make a big scene, but also messy, sin, you know, technically Mary is in sin, right, at this point in time because she's pregnant even though she's not married yet. She's in sin, and he's like, messy, sinful person, you know what? I just, no thanks. I want to take a pause from that. And I think what came to mind for me today is that so oftentimes in my life, I think, I approach people that way. And I look at people in the world that way. Um, I've been conditioned, and maybe you have too, maybe we in the church have been conditioned a little bit, to get so focused on what's right and wrong. And who's living life right and wrong? In the right and wrong way, at the right and wrong time. You know, we... A lot of times I look at this as sort of a rule book and that this is not only my rule book, but this should be everybody else's rule book too, no matter if they're trying to follow Jesus or not. And when people don't follow my rule book, when they're not getting the right and wrong, and when they're kind of, you know, those sinful people and they got messes going on in their lives and they're messy, then I want to stay away. And not only do I want to stay away, but I want to say, that's not right. That's wrong. But try to be nice about it, just like Joseph was. You know, well, quietly, you know, I'll just, I'll just think it in my mind. I think today, what I want to challenge us is to, to be people that are comfortable with 
messy. Messy people, messy situations. And to be disciples who are open to being around people who maybe don't follow the right, wrong things that we have signed up for. This story actually makes me think of the story of John 8. Jesus, uh, there's a woman who's brought forward who has been caught in adultery in John 8. That's the situation that basically Mary was in at this point in time, right? She had had sex outside of marriage. She was an adulteress and could have been brought forward in this big public way that this woman was at the beginning of John 8. And Jesus... And the teachers of the law, you know, they're like, this is a mess. We got to address the mess. This is wrong. She didn't fall the right way. We got to make a big deal out of it. And how does Jesus respond to that? He says, if you haven't sinned, whoever, you know, has not sinned, you can be the first one to throw a stone at her. And of course, none of them stay. And so as we approach messy people, messy situations, um, people that maybe aren't doing everything that we think they should. I want to challenge us to approach it the way Jesus did rather than the way Joseph did in these first two passages. To not only be open to that and to welcoming those people and to loving them, um, but to take a look at ourselves and maybe see where we're broken and where we might uh, not have sinned ourselves. And that actually leads me to our second point, which is to be saved. So the second point is to be saved. And it, the passage continues, and thankfully, this isn't the end of Joseph's story. So after Joseph had considered this plan he's made, right? An angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So this, obviously, is a big-time game-changer for Joseph, because now he's got new information. This baby is not his, but it's God's. And rightfully so, when I look at this passage, and most of the time when we first approach this passage, this is the big deal. Joseph gets to know that this is God's child, but I actually think that we need to take a look at the second part of what the angel says to Joseph and think of it as a really big deal. Because the angel continues, right, and says, she's going to give birth to a son. You're to give him the name Jesus, Yeshua, God saves. And what is this son of yours going to save? He's going to save people from their sins. That would have been a big deal, too, to Joseph. Because he lived in a context and a time where they had a way to deal with their sin and it didn't involve a son of his whose name was Jesus. It was sacrifices in the temple and a system that they had in place for how they could take care of their sin. And so I think this would have been equally mind-blowing potentially for Joseph to think, whoa, we're going to have a savior and he's my son and he's going to save people from their sins. But I don't know if Joseph was ready for it. I don't know if we're ready for it. Joseph lived in a culture where they had a good sin management practice in place. You know, I sin, I sacrifice, I go to the temple, I take care of it. We've got a way, God, to how to take care of our sin. It doesn't involve this, this crazy baby plan you got going on. To be honest, we are pretty good at sin management today. I'm pretty good at it. I did a bad thing, maybe later that week I'll try and do two good things to make up for it. You know what I'm saying? Or I thought, I thought ill of that person who was in that mess, so maybe later on I'll, I'll say a quick prayer for them. You know, that'll, that'll help offset my judgment. You know, we're, we're conditioned to be people who think that we can handle our sin problems ourselves many times. We're a lot like Joseph in the first century. Sin management practices, we still have those today. But the big news today is that Joseph gets the fact that we are gonna have a savior come and save us from our sins. And I wanna tell you, you have a savior today who's gotta come save you from your sin. You have a big problem. I have a big problem. 
It's called sin. It's called brokenness. And if we don't think that we got a big problem, then we don't need Jesus to come at Christmas. If you don't think you got a big problem, then you don't need Jesus. In my uh, time living in California and as a pastor, one of the things I learned is that I always wanted to be around people who thought that they were the biggest screw-ups. I wanted to be around the people who thought that their life was a mess, that they didn't have it all together, that they would often say, I'm a screw-up, I'm a failure, I'm down on my luck, whatever. At first, when I was a pastor, I thought, I need to get around the, the people who you know, look like their lives are put together and that you know, they, they look like they're you know, they know all the Jesus stuff well. But the longer I was, the more I learned, I gotta get around the people who think that they have the biggest problem with sin and brokenness. Because those people, they know they need Jesus. And they want Jesus because they can't change their life without him. And there was a guy in the New Testament, I don't know if you've heard of him, his name's Paul. And Paul when they ask him who he is, he says, I am the chief of sinners. Number one sinner right here. My name is Paul. He says, I'm the biggest problem with the world. I am the biggest sinner. I need Jesus the most. I need Jesus more than anybody. And when I spent time with people who thought that they had the biggest problem with sin, they thought Jesus was the biggest deal and that he had the best love and that his grace was bigger than they ever thought it could be. Jesus tells a story, or not, he tells a story in response to a situation once. It's in Luke 7, if you've ever read it. But Jesus, he's sitting down to dinner with a bunch of uh, Pharisees, teachers of the law, and a woman comes in, and she starts anointing his oil with perfume. And the Pharisees are bent out of shape about this. They don't like it, it's a waste of money. Why is she here? She's a sinner. And he tells a story about one person who had a $5,000 debt and they get it forgiven. And then another person who has a $50 debt and they get it forgiven. And he asks, who do you think, one, um, basically he says, who do you think was more grateful? Who do you think was, was more pleased? And they said, well, the person with the $5,000 debt. And he's like, you're right. If your sins are forgiven little, then there's, that's little, but your sins are forgiven big, that's, that's big love. So what I want to say today is that encourage us that we would be a church filled with a bunch of chief sinners rather than holy rule followers. That we out here would just be like, you know what? I'm actually number one broken out here. That we would be in a challenge to one another of how much we need Jesus. And I'm not saying that so that we all walk around just fixated on how we're broken, but rather that we would walk around fixated on how much we need Jesus. You know what I'm saying? I don't want us to, to, to center in on the fact that, that we're broken, 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 but rather that I need Jesus, 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 Jesus. And I need love, 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 and I need grace, 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 grace. That's what I'm talking about. Because if we start to admit that... Um, you know, that we're broken and we know it, that we have a sin problem and we own it, that if we don't have it all together and we admit it, that that's really where grace starts, whenever we get to that point. And the bigger the grace, the more Jesus in our lives. And I think that's really what I need. I know that's what I need. So let's close, though, with our third point, which is really the title of today's sermon, uh, which was to be available. And it's a two-part here, listen and respond. So the close is be available, listen and respond. And here's the last part of our passage today. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. So this closing section is, it's really a, a redemption arc here for Joseph. 
because we had him in the first two verses when he didn't want to be a part of the mess. But now the close is this. Joseph listens to God, and then he responds in obedience. So that's why being available, it's listening to God and then responding in obedience. It's a two-part process. So first, listen. Now, it could be easy today for me and for you to read this story and to kind of write it off in terms of listening to God because it's kind of old fairy tale, CJ. There's an angel that comes to Joseph in a dream. We're not really doing that anymore, CJ. That doesn't really happen. How am I really supposed to listen to God? That's so difficult. It doesn't really happen, right? Well, I'll say this today. It's, it's not easy all the time to listen to God. And it's not the same for everybody. So that doesn't make it easy to preach on how we're supposed to listen to God because God made each of us differently. God made each of you with a unique imprint of his image. But we all listen differently. We listen differently to each other in conversations. So it shouldn't be a surprise that we all probably are going to listen to God differently. But let's start with one reality, and it's a reality that's in our passage today. Jesus comes, and he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. So if we're trying to be a people who can be available, that we're trying to be a people who listen, let's, let's start with just that reality. God is with us. Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us. So now... You're living your life every day. You're living, you're working, you're eating, you're playing, you're with family, and you remind yourself, God is with me all the time. God is with me. So now as you're living and working and playing and eating, you just look for what's going on around you and try to hear a little bit up in your brain what maybe God's pointing you to because the reality is, is that God is with us. God is with us. Um, not only is God with us, but I want to say today that he lives in us through the Holy Spirit, too. I couldn't get the song out of my head this morning. If you've ever seen The Lion King, the musical, it's, he lives in you. <laughs> He lives in me. Now they're talking about something else, but it really, that's, that's the spirit, okay? So if you ever go see the Lion King and they sing that song, just think that that's the Holy Spirit living in you, okay? Okay, back to the sermon. So God is with us. God lives in us. So now you can listen all the time around you because God's with you and he lives in you. So my story is this. Back when I was a high schooler, I worked one summer in the parts center at Vermeer. And during that time, with some friends, we were looking at different Bible verses. And one of the Bible verses, it said, pray continually. So I got this bright idea. Well, it says pray continually, pray all the time. So I'm going to try to pray all the time, continually, while I'm working in the parts center. So I showed up that day or whatever that week, and I clocked in at seven, and as I was receiving parts in and pushing my cart around with the parts and putting them away on the shelves, I just thought, I'm going to just pray, just pray, just pray, just pray. So I was praying for family and friends, and soon enough, I was praying for, for the dog and the neighbor's dog, and I was praying for the world, and by the end of the day, I was just praying that it wouldn't be so hot and humid and muggy and that we wouldn't get any more parts in that day, you know. Uh, by the end of it, I was praying all sorts of different things, but I was just praying, and it made me recognize that God is there all the time, and I can pray to him all the time. He's with me. It helped me to kind of be listening to him. And it only lasted probably for like one or two days because I just could not keep up that momentum. But it actually reminds me of what has often happened to me now. And it's a, it's a term, there's a term that I'm going to use, and it's a term that one of my friends in California, I'm going to call him T., T coined this term, and it's spiritual blackout. That many times I go to work now, I clock in, and I go into what I call spiritual blackout. From seven to five, from eight to five, whatever it is, I'm like, forget about God. I did my morning devotions, maybe I prayed, and then nothing. 
And then maybe I'll come back to the dinner table and we'll pray again and I'll, I'll be thinking about, oh yeah, there, there's God there, you know? And this, I don't think that this is a unique experience to me, at least I hope not. I think a lot of us go into spiritual blackout. We're living our day, we're, we're running the errands, we're watching the kids, we're going to work, and, and there's so many things that are going on. And it's, it's hard to be tuned into what God is trying to say all the time. And with that today, I want to say that's okay. Because Jesus knows how hard it is. In Hebrews, it says this about Jesus. It says he's able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses because the story of Christmas is he became human. So if you think about how it's hard during your day because your mind is so full of thoughts and you have so many things to do and you, you just, you're frazzled and you just have too much going on, too much on your, on your plate, Jesus knows what that's like. I think there were a lot of days where Jesus had too much on his plate. What do you think? Jesus knows what that's like. And he knows how hard it is to stay in tune all the time. But he's there with us. And I always want to say that Jesus is for you too. Jesus is rooting us on to connect with him, to listen to him, to know him more. So as best we can, we just got to try to listen. So now there's a second part though, respond. Because being available, it's not just listening to God, but it's responding in obedience. The passage says, Joseph woke up and he did what the angel had commanded him. Joseph woke up and he didn't say, oh, that was a really interesting dream. Maybe I'll, uh, I gotta go get my morning cup of coffee. No, he does what God asks him to do. And God is calling each of us, I think, in little ways and in big ways to listen and respond to him. So we have to take steps when we've listened to God then to respond in obedience and to do what he calls us to do. And you might say, CJ, would you mind sharing with me a list of what God might be calling me to do in obedience? And I'm here to tell you today, I can't because you're different from me and your story is different than mine. And God made you uniquely. So God is going to call you to do different things than he's going to call me to do. But I will say this this morning. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If the thing you feel like you're listening to God and he's nudging you to do sound or look like that, then do it. Because that's the fruit of the Spirit. So that's the Spirit at work. So if it's one of those things that he's calling you to do, then do it. There's a song in the movie, I'm not big into the kids' movies yet, but there's one in Frozen 2. It's kind of a sad song, but it's called Do the Next Right Thing. I'm going to co-opt that and amend it today and say we're supposed to do the next spirit thing or the next Jesus thing. So sometimes it's little things, but you got to step in and do it. So if, if it's like Jesus too, if it's either love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, or if what you're about to do, you think this looks like Jesus, then do it. Then do it and just see what happens. One of the things that sometimes the Spirit nudges me to do um, is to not just say, I'm praying for you, but to say, can I pray for you right now? And I have had a few people deny me, but for the most part, everybody says, yeah, you can pray for me right now. And I think we'd be surprised at the little things that you might get to do in cooperation with the Spirit during the day when he invites you, if you just step out and do it. And I wanna encourage you today that sometimes the things that you might think are little things can be really big deals. I remember when I was a, a part of a couples group in California, that we had a couple who was about to have their kid, I think it was their fourth kid, but one of the other couples in our couples group said, had the idea, we should, we should do a baby shower for them. And so we did a baby shower for them, and, and honestly, the couple that had that idea, it was no big deal to them, it was a little thing. You know, let, I'll just, you know, we'll just put some, we'll get some snacks together, we'll put some decorations up, and everybody that's in the couples group can buy a present for them. And that couple had never had a baby shower for their first three kids. They had never been celebrated like that. 
They were so excited. They, they couldn't believe it. And there were only like 10 couples. So they only got, got like 10 gifts or whatever. But they were just floored. So think too. Something that you might think is little is a big deal to somebody else. And God might want to use that to bless them and to show them his love. But the other thing is, is that God might call you, and as you're listening to him, he might have you do a big thing that's a big deal. Because let's be, let's be frank, what God called Joseph to do was a big deal. He is not the father, and everybody knows that because he's been honest that he isn't gonna consummate this marriage, and he sticks with Mary, and he stays with her. And that meant that Joseph got ostracized from his community that he was seen as a lawbreaker staying with her. And his family didn't want him around. And we know that because when the time came for Jesus to be born, nobody had any room for him. That's why they end up in an inn or in a cave is because nobody in their family wanted anything to do with Joseph and Mary because they were living in sin. So this is a big deal. It is a big deal. And now he's like, and this is not your kid, but you're gonna raise him and he's gonna be the savior of the world. That's a big deal. So sometimes God is gonna, you're gonna listen and God's gonna call you to do something and it's a big deal. And here's the thing, sometimes God will call you like Joseph to do something that results in a loss, that results in something that's uncomfortable, that results in sacrifice. And we have to learn that that is okay. Because in America, we are culturally conditioned that our lives should be ever perpetually, eternally up and to the right on the graph. More, more, more. That our job is always going to be up and to the right. We're always going to be making more money and we're going to have more kids and they're going to be better than our other kids. I don't know, something, right? <laughs> the stock market is always going to be going up and to the right, right? And so our lives should always be going up and to the right. But here's the story of Christmas. Jesus, who being in very nature God, he was God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but instead he made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness, and he became obedient to death, even death on a criminal's cross. That's the story of Christmas. Eternity with God to nothing. And Jesus says, follow me. You're to be a disciple who looks like me. So if God calls you to do something where you're gonna lose and where it's not gonna lead to up and to the right, that's gonna be difficult, but it might be Jesus speaking. And to close, I wanna say that sometimes we only can see what God is up to when we look back in hindsight. So when he calls us to do something that's seems down, that seems like a loss, that seems like a sacrifice, because I'm sure it did for Joseph. But I'm sure years later, when Joseph got to look back at the decision he made to help Mary raise the Savior and how Jesus changed the world, I'm sure Joseph said, that was worth it. That was worth it. So today, little things, big things. Get into the messiness. Get into the messiness in ourselves. Jesus is so big. And as he calls us to do stuff, as we're available, we're gonna get to look back and see what he's done. To close, I'm gonna invite us into a time of response. We're gonna sing a few songs and there's gonna be an opportunity to be prayed for. And there's also gonna be an opportunity to receive communion. And I wanna invite you to, to both. Maybe you don't have to say exactly what's going on, but maybe you need prayer because today you're, you're realizing, like me, that I'm a little more broken than I thought, but I'm excited because I get to receive more Jesus than I knew I needed before. And I also want to invite you to communion too, because this for me is an encapsulation of the sermon today. Jesus, that's a messy table right there because Jesus is seated around 12 disciples, one of which is going to betray him, a few of which are gonna turn their backs on him, all of which are gonna walk away from him for the most part as he dies on a cross. And he says, I eagerly desire to eat this meal with you. So Jesus, he's not afraid of the mess. He gets to that table with them. And then Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. You don't know it, but 
You're more broken than you ever thought and you're more loved than you could ever believe. So receive this, it's me. And so maybe today that's an act for you, a tangible act in response of how much you need Jesus because you know what happens every time we receive that? Jesus strengthens us. He meets us in it. And he shows us more of who he is. So as we leave into this week leading up to Christmas, let's not be afraid to be messy with people. Let's be saved. Let's be people that know how much we need Jesus. And let's be available, listening and responding as God calls us. Jesus, we thank you today. We thank you for Joseph, that even though his story didn't start out perfect, that he ended in obedience to, to you. And that his obedience changed the world. Holy Spirit, show us today what you might be calling us to do how you might be calling us to step into this world and change it for you. Show us today, Jesus, how much we need you and how much you love us and how much grace there is for us that we might be a church filled with chief sinners who have also been chiefly loved and chiefly graced by you. So we thank you, Jesus, for who you are. We love you and we praise you in your name.